Welcome to the Leadership Labs with DeepRec.ai, a podcast where we delve into the fascinating world of deep tech entrepreneurship, company founders, and venture capitalists. I'm your host, Anthony Kelly, and I'm thrilled to have you join us in this exciting journey. In each episode, we explore the minds behind groundbreaking technologies, the visionaries who dare to push the boundaries of innovation, and the investors who fuel the growth of tomorrow's game changers. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this week's podcast episode with today's guest, uh, Morela Moose, who is the founder of Get Product People. Uh, in this episode, what we'll talk about is Morela's background and product, what led her to starting up Get Product People, the importance of the product manager, and uh, why she feels it's important that when a startup is founded, that one of the co founders pivot into this and take ownership of it. Um, but yeah, before we, we get into this, Morena, why don't you jump in, tell us about yourself, uh, tell us. Thanks a lot, tell, Anthony. Tell us where you quick got your request. passion. Uh, quick, quick rest. So our company name is Product People, legal entity is called Product People Gembeha, uh, but, but I, we are not Get Product People, the Get Product People that come is the website and it was a former legal entity name. So I would prefer we we're introduced as Product People. Um, Perfect. And it, it it just helps uh, to not perpetuate kind of the old. I'm I'm curious, like where do you have this from? It's just like the mnemonic of the website. I think it was on your. I got it off your LinkedIn, I believe. Whenever I first got the notes that I shared with you and I sent, it was from a, or maybe it was from one of the um, presentations you sent you sent to me. Uh, I will then check. I know we've renamed the legal entity everywhere, but I did notice sometimes there are maybe some scrapers or some old tools who just put the name of the website instead of the company's name. Yeah, no, I, I would have got it from somewhere. I didn't scrape it. But look, I'll um, I'll, I'll start um, again. I will check. This, this is a very good point. Thanks a lot. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. Today's guest is Morena Moose, who is a founder at Product People. Um, in this episode, Morena will talk to us about the importance of a product manager uh, and why she feels it's very important that in an early business that co-founders should take a role in product. Um but yeah, before we do any of this, Morena, why don't you come on, introduce yourself and tell us tell us a little bit about, about yourself. Thanks a lot, Anthony. Mirella, founder of Product People. We do interim product management as a service and uh, also curate one of Europe's largest product management community. Uh, this is part uh, of our mission to help companies discover and deliver great products. Uh, so the way we make money is through the interim work like rental covers or when an employee is exiting or being exited from a company uh, also with a decent roles like product owner and product ops the way we give back to the world is through the free events that we live stream every week um, and and also offline conference participation or, or speaking um, as, as well as joining this uh, podcast um, we are a team of 40 people distributed first across europe mainly eu and germany and we work with Europe's top product companies uh, like Zalando, Deepel, and many others, and also companies that are established and do a lot of good in the world, like the World Health Organization. Yes, it's a good thing. Now, where did it all begin for you? Where did uh, where did your passion for for product come from, or, or what got you into into that space? I started doing it before it was trendy, because now we're seeing also candidates pivoting from biz dev, from recruiting, from anything um, into product as it's it's kind of the new consulting or wherever someone in the past wanted to go into X. Now product seems to be the hyped X that people want to go to. And, and we also see the, to this um, associate role that we have open, uh, how many different types of people try to pivot into it, in, including engineering managers and all, all these roles that have like a nicer life and, and like an easier role. Um, it's, it's, it's way, way more hype than it was about 12 years ago when I started that. I also started doing product before I knew it was product. It was called business analysis um, at an iDiverse uh, company that later exited to Northern. And 
it was also <laughs> similar to our roles when someone else inside the organization failed to deliver. Um, I, I was the individual contributor who took on extra responsibility and helped um, shepherd and ship an internal initiative that ended up being an internal employee portal and a CRM system that at that time, that company thought it's a good idea to build as they were between 350 and 500 people distributed in two locations. So it had anything, you know, how this is now taken over by different SaaS tools who sold this, but it was an excellent opportunity to get noticed internally and try to then laterally move into this role, which was not approved because these roles were only in Germany at that time. So I ended up joining another company that was doing ad tech, um, later sold to Pandora radio stations. And in that company, I had the official role of product manager, product owner. Uh, so that was 2012, many, many years ago. And also was lucky to get it because I didn't have anything on my CV that would um, highlight me for that role. But such was the market back then that I had a tech background and an MBA and had the story to tell from what I did in the past company without having the title and having gained the experience. And that was appreciated. And I started now officially doing the role. Yeah, well, look, let's let's get into the take of it then. You know, you've, you've mentioned um, product owner, product manager. What, what's each one and what's what's their responsibilities? It, it depends who you ask. Um, so at Product People, that's, we were, of course, very opinionated. <laughs> um, sure. So for I before like someone starts lynching me on LinkedIn for I'm going to say, I can say that I appreciate in some traditional industries, product manager is a marketing function. So when these traditional industries like health tech, pharma-ish create a digital product, they would call this like a digital product manager or product owner because they want to differentiate from the marketing fun traditionally marketing function. So I appreciate the history and I understand that. Um, it is still a cookie cutter agile scrum role. So I believe that at the minimum people should know it, but you should also know project management, which a lot of people mock and then glorify this product ownership thing. In, instead of saying, okay, this is a building block. So from the product people's perspective, how we level people and how we build up these competencies in, internally, we think project management is at the base of everything or and anything you want to be successful in life, you need to be able to prioritize on the fly, execute on the stuff that you want to be either uh, within the our organization at clients and so on, right? So that's just basic of getting anything done you need to sort yourself and get yourself organized and ping other people about what they're doing and whichever side. Then the next part of this is, okay, what are the common methodologies used across multiple companies? Most of them dive, um, go to a version of Agile, Scrum, or so on. There's also Shape Up, and, and there are other ways of organizing work um, at the tactical level. And, and then, then this is where the product ownership part comes in. This is for us more of an L2, L3, so associate product management consultant uh, or an early PM1 that you notice, but we expect like, okay, if, so, if a client asks for a product owner, it means they're mostly expecting tactical e support. There's clearly not a lot of strategy or high level alignment or the more mighty Kagan type of work needed because this is how they scope the function internally it's expected then maybe business does more of this driving the numbers whereas in the more modern organization um they went to the product team and said hey we want to be a bit positive make it happen right you you keep uh, telling us that um, you want to be empowered here we go you are empowered you are now responsible for getting this done or you may not be here in the next six to 12 months and we'll get someone else who can do it, right? So this has also this carrot and stick type of effect, um, which many people who complained about being handhold and micromanaged haven't also seen the reverse side when it's like, sure, you are empowered, now go do. 
Uh, and, and this will be the more sophisticated type of organizations, um, which also try to optimize into having as clients, because this is also where um, we drive our people to learn the way we think it's better to do product. And, and these companies have also been more successful recently. Uh, first of all, it also reduces a lot of coordination effects. So by example, um, one of the older school companies um, had managed to get themselves convinced by a body leasing vendor to take a business analyst, a product owner, and they had a product manager on a more commercial go-to-market side. So all of a sudden you had three roles that needed to talk to each other that did a lot of overlapping things. Um, and my my first comment was like, why, why are you paying three people when you could have one? Um, and they're like, no, but there's like, we're operating in 16 markets and plan to expand more and so on. I was like, well, but then it sounds like we should look at adding product operations uh, rather than making the product manager role ridiculous here. And it also seems like everyone is complaining. Stakeholders are complaining. Dev doesn't feel like they're working on the right priorities. And even these three people are not happy themselves. Uh, so, so maybe there's something we could look into that would optimize things, save money, make everyone slightly happier. So I hope this anecdotal story um, helps pa yeah. paint a picture of how we look at the market and how we appraise organizations that we engage with, with that also understanding what's the level of support our people are going to need when they go in there, parachute in, are immediately responsible to show traction and a turnaround. This gives you the opportunity to uh work as a full function as opposed to three separate functions that there will always be communication barriers walls um and just makes it makes it that little bit more difficult um i wanted to ask it as well because one thing that i'm sure you i hope you don't get it as much these days but there's obviously a lot of misconceptions around around product and i mean even some are as basic as people not understanding the difference between a project manager and a product manager right like what what do you see as as the the most common misconceptions and i know we, i know we've mentioned we've mentioned one or two already but uh where where do people often get it wrong it depends who you ask and at what stage um so we didn't know this early stage companies are sometimes harder as clients while having the less financial support they could offer or compensate us for, um, and sometimes not a very good understanding of what the job takes. So the, uh, we've made it a policy that to some degree, if we feel like we're not going to be successful within the um, monthly engagement fee that the client is willing to pay, we may give it a pass because at this point, it can be also a reputational risk for us. Um, and to give the context, founders come in and say, what's the minimum time allowance you can give me because my budget is tight um and then they would say oh all right you said that what you recommend is minimum at two days per week or three days per week can you make it one day and just have the pm show up only at our stand-ups during the week um and and monitor some ceremonies and i was like how are we able to have valuable input at these stand-ups and and join the ceremonies if there's no preparation time, if we're not going to be around. Like imagine you're thrown in some meeting every day and people ask you, is like, I'm blocked because such and such. Um, and or, all right, so this, these are the things that we politely turned down. We, we suggested that they rather reconvert someone internally or find a, a more budget efficient alternative. But that would be one of the misconceptions that the um, PM is just someone that needs to show up at some meetings. Um, whip the dev team and then you know there's like the single management you come in uh, crap on everyone and then make a lot of noise and leave uh, like like a single it, instead of okay so this is actually the unblocking facilitator that smooths it out for everyone so that they deliver something that's really meaningful and i will feel yeah that that is basically meetings equals the only valuable work and and then when one of these organizations grows, it ends up with the PMs having meetings on meetings um, that some of the coaching engagements we had weren't even so much about frameworks or personal development. It was stakeholder management and how do I get rid of meetings? 
and, and, and then again, like stakeholder management and getting rid of more meetings. I would say this is more because at some point you can also live with the whole product owner naming and all the scrums limitations and so on. If someone is smart enough, learns how to navigate your organization, talk the language and still do things despite the poor setup, but you still, of course, need a um, more adaptable person and more seniority to see behind the veils of all the frameworks and, and buzz that's going around. And it's it's not only with that, right? This is just like the old school thing. Also, people um, over-index what product-led growth can do because it's, it feels like, oh, now this is the shiny new distribution model. But yeah, there's there's still a lot of other things you can do. And if you take a step back, this is also what product should have always been responsible for driving the business and driving adoption and not relying on salespeople to pressure call the client into signing up to your uh crammy UI, right? So it's, uh, of course, you need a lot of high touch at enterprise level and when, when dealing with regulatory, but it's, it's still something like, okay, going back to the basics, the product should actually work and drive adoption itself at the minimum. Uh, hope, hope this rant helped. Yeah, no, I mean, and that's, that leads us not perfectly up to where I wanted to ask next, you know, you've spoken about early stage companies. <clears throat> And about having a co-founder pivoting into it and you know typically look it's i know there's again it's, it's who you ask it's where the business is but how soon do you think someone should be really looking to take ownership of of the product piece if it's a co-founder let's say in some cases a lot of cases in tech organizations right it's two computer scientists they grow to 10 people they have eight engineers one marketing one HR, that's the team, right? They don't necessarily, it's all engineering. We're an engineering business. We've an engineering culture. It's, I know it's never too late to introduce a product focus, mm -hmm. but when, when should they really start to consider and start to be looking and, and considering product led growth? Um, I think that's, first of all, product led growth only post product market fit. Uh, you know, you, you don't want to scale and amp your distribution unless you have something that's good to distribute. And th th that would be the first part. In in the setup that you mentioned with eight engineers and two non-technical roles, maybe it works like that. I don't know what the product is about. Maybe someone is already doing PM work without having the title. Because if you have eight people, someone is doing some sort of prioritization and coordination. The coordination can also be a tech lead but still someone is prioritizing something. And that person is then the PM and having an, hopefully, an idea in which direction they're going. So probably in that setup, uh, they're, they're either biting the bullet and bringing a completely non-technical business-driven PM, or they have someone very technical, but there's still someone keeping an eye on, on the business because else they're just going to end up with like some shiny tech without a commercial or user-facing application uh, or the ability to introduce that in a timely manner. Mm. So perfect, just, just, just to lead up to that. So if someone is taking this PM role and they are looking to find that ultimate product market fit within a startup, how much time should they spend speaking to customers or potential key market customers. I, I like, so if, if, if like someone is just getting into it, uh, I would definitely recommend Teresa Torres uh, book about continuous discovery when it's like always be speaking to customers and always trying to keep a, a pulse on the market. Um, another good example, once you discovered what you do well is April's uh, Donfold, obviously awesome book, because then that helps you separate the noise between the type of customers you want to prioritize on. So the, stepping back with how often should I speak with customers and what should I do? It, it depends what you're working on um, and and where you are at. Um, I did see a tendency. So when people start being more discovery driven, ending up a bit slowing down everywhere, which actually gives a bit more pressure from the business because like, no, we should be shipping, we should be doing. And at an early stage, to some degree, you should kind of be shipping and doing because you're not a Zalando where all the big bets need to be super huge and 
have stock price improved, you are probably running out of money if you're an early stage startup in six months, if you have that that much. So you need to kind of fight for your life and do something right now. And it's not going to be perfect and you're not going to follow the frameworks, but hey, does this make sense in this current context with the info you have? Is this a good decision? Then yes, go for it. And at some point you're going to build up the understanding of how much discovery is enough because that's then the question you know like how many customers should i be talked to is this the five five customer interviews rule uh, how do i find them how do i select them how do i make sure i don't um just ask the same five people all the time that may start not being relevant um how do i make sure i don't bias them or, or really understand the purchase intent and and so on and so forth and you know people may also just think they're going to do something and then not do it right and then that's that's another problem my impression of this would be just be pragmatic adapt to what you have there and think also from first principles at and at anything any stage before c you should always prioritize speed get getting things on top of the user while i'm not over stretching yourself uh, as as in like building too much too fast and and so on while you don't have the funding or just the power to sustain it you mentioned in there uh, continuous customer discovery. Um, can you just sort of elaborate a little bit more on that for the people that don't have? Uh... It's also similar with what salespeople would do or customer success, right? Um, diving deeper into the problem someone has, um, un understanding the, the job to be done, understanding the frequency, the pain, how are they solving it right now? Are they motivated enough to solve it? And then going from there, um, it's, Harder to generalize is mostly ask people what they're doing and also better yet observe how are they doing what they're doing, understanding also the macro forces behind it, because maybe you have like this perfect recruiting solution that you want to sell to people, uh, but adoption is going to be pretty hard because organizations have already a greenhouse or team tailor or wherever. And, and then there's GDPR and candidate compliance. And, and, and then there are all of these layers. So just discovery alone and recruiters or people complaining about their current ATS. And believe me, no one has an ATS that they like because we really tried finding one. We've already migrated from one to another, which we hate. <laughs> and and it's, you know, it's, it's like one of these. So if you talk with everyone in any company, you could come with the conclusion that, hey, we should build an ATS tool great margins once you're in there very hard to tur turn on and off right uh, un unless it it takes a significant effort so let's let's go do and um, but then you think okay how how are you testing that what you're doing is better how how will you drive adoption what are the unseen factors that are pulling this um are, are giving uh, presence to the tools and, and if you look back there are so many companies trying to disrupt what SAP is doing on, on a certain niche. And still, it's, SAP has maintained a huge market share. Um, I would say, yeah, discovery is good, but it's not alone. You need to, to understand the whole journey of consumption, purchase consumption and use and, and how that maps up. So sometimes maybe it's easier a bit in B2C but it also requires significant investment into driving adoption, right? Because you're going to be yet another app that does something. It's unlikely you have, would have thought of something that other companies aren't already doing in some shape or form. Do you feel that um, startup companies, if they don't have a product focus, that they might struggle with scaling? Mm, yes and no. It, it depends also what drives that. Um, I would say in B2B, it's harder to see because in the beginning, you kind of need to act like an agency or you need stronger sales pool to bring everything in. Uh, unless you kind of start from the get-go with this mindset, uh, which I've seen a few companies do, including ourselves. We didn't have, we now have one salesperson that just joins, joined us um, a week or so ago, it's more in um, facilitator operational capacity, 
but if you don't have this background, so I understand to some degree how hard it is to become product led once you're starting from sales led, because we went from product led and had tried to realize that at a certain account size, you need someone that just deals with the purchasing department. The purchasing department is heavy and slow and, and takes two months or, or contract follow-up. So it's just that with volume, it ends up being one headcount's capacity that needs to follow up on the slow movers because this is how companies just work. Um, and, and unless they bring like some consultancy to restructure their whole purchasing process, which they'd have no interest to do because it's mostly vendors who want to get in, they have enough vendors that are interested to work with them. It's not going to change. So I understand how difficult it is to go from one side to the other when you have just been successful in doing one one thing. Our suggestion was try it out, try it like in a separate pocket. If that is successful, roll it out, but don't dismiss it completely because maybe this is also how the business works. Um, and we saw this also practically with our people. So one of the B2B clients we're working from UK managed to sign a large governmental contract with, with a nice lock-in and everything, right? So that's for a small company. As a founder, I know it ensures pretty good runway. You can build a customer base and so on. It, of course, came in with a hook of some customization that was needed just for that large client a pressure to update the roadmap so that you make that time frame where the um, large client was switching another vendor and competitor of yours out and so on. So, so that's also a decision that many product managers hate because it's like, oh, okay, now we're a feature factory. Yeah. But strategically for the company, it ensures runway, it ensures a paying customer, it comes with a drawback that now you need to figure out, okay, you started serving enterprise when you maybe weren't ready to serve enterprise and you wanted to have this um, simpler scalable solution that you, you send to SMEs. And, and now it, this changes your focus. So how are we dealing with it internally? One, one successful method I've seen with at a company where they just had a separate team that dealt with enterprise. So there was the the regular product team that just dealt with, hey, we're product led and we're doing this and that and we're optimizing costs and minimizing human interactions everywhere while still getting a great experience and adoption and, and so on. And then there was the other team dealing with implementation rollouts and customizations for hyper large accounts. Oh. And everyone oh. seemed happy. Uh, so so I, I felt that was a somehow a great setup, not super sure how it went from a code base perspective. It's at some point they had to maintain two products as a company, but at least from a um, perception perspective, everyone involved was happy. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I was gonna ask you about that. Did it result in a split of two teams? And then again, yeah, how, how messy how messy did it go? Um, but look, if, if, if it still works and it's fine, not, not to worry about, you've got, You've got some good revenue coming in to uh, to fill out the team to cover to cover all bases. Yeah, um, there are always downsides. So um, we are sometimes also brought in by clients that are like, "Oh, such and such is doing this framework." It's uh, you know OKRs were hot. Now narrative commitment tasks are hot, and and I always tend to tell you know you need to choose your poison. There's always going to be downsides to something. There's always going to be some level of adoption. Culture plays in. It's it never goes by the book. And in any cases, you just need to make an informed bet or decision. Also, see if this is a revolving door decision. So basically, can you do it? Turn it around with without too many downsides or none. And, and then basically gain speed by deciding on things very fast? Or, or is it a one-way decision where it will be very hard to turn back once you've done it uh, just due to the costs and risks and exposure? And, and that's about it. It's more of, okay, deciding what kind of downsides you can live with for some potential upsides. Nice, nice. Um I did want to sort of just ask another question about the let's say co-founder pivoting into a product role. Um, if we look at that and we look at that transition, 
and they're coming from a dominant engineering business or a dominant engineering team, where where would they initially sit and what should their level or line of communication look like with the engineering team? And again, look, I know it's totally open depending on the business, but I mean, if, if someone says, right, we need to be product, we've got Johnny and we've got John, and they're like, one of us has to do it. And mm -hmm. like, where do we start? Depends who's also already doing it now. Um, my preference would be to have product at sea level, but of, of course I'm biased. Um, I, I also saw in smaller companies or in companies that signal that delivery is still an unresolved issue, um, at least from a business trust perspective, that sometimes they make someone CTPO. So you're in charge to some degree of the product, but more importantly of the delivery of that product. And, and that's usually a signal that business or sales is the factor that contribute mo more to the direction and, and the way. I like something that Melissa Perry said at a conference in the last weeks. She said, we went from business and product being two departments that kind of have friction with each other to business becoming product and product becoming business. And, and to some degree in, in this day and age, you need to be aligned and you need to drive the, the same things the same way. And that comes also from having a common product strategy to the visibility and operational level. Because many times problems also come either for, from a lack of visibility or a lack of trust of, of what's going on. And people resolve this in different ways in different organizations, but core problems are also those. And that would be to each person to see what they want to address. And it's not necessarily about who gets the title. Um, I, I would still suggest it that it's somewhere where they can make a decision so that the focus doesn't go too much into, oh, we, we should split the team because the tech stack is split like that. Yes, but that doesn't make sense from a user perspective. The user doesn't need to guess your department structure from the UI um, yeah. because that, that, that you've already failed. If you feel, ah, oh, okay, this was the handover from the marketing landing page now to the product onboarding screen, uh, or, okay, now I'm handed over to some legacy part of the app, even like the URL changes and the branding is slightly different. Um, oh, the checkout seems to be hosted elsewhere. And now also some stuff shifted around. That's, that's clearly not the greatest experience, but it's of course very hard to, to do, right? And I know there, there are lots of legacy systems and there's a lot of history that sometimes, even if someone comes in with the best intention, is going to take years and years to have things surface. And maybe that would be my next advice is, I did notice that with product being hyped and an in-demand position, at least until 2020, mid-2020, when now <laughs> due to the layoffs, many positions became less in-demand and, and more um, supply on the market, on the talent side. Everyone lost their patience. So I did see a lot of product managers just exiting after a year. Then they know to the new company and exit again and exit again and exit again. Uh, probably they got a few K increase here and there. But then again, you don't have a time to make an impact, especially in larger organizations, um, at least from a recruiter friend at one of those, they said they try to dismiss people with a one year experience because they know in their organization it's going to take two years to make an impact. So they had structured their comp plan and bonuses and equity grants that once you cross the two year mark, you, you a lot of things happen. Before that, um, and, and there was even like an internal knowledge about this, people who leave after uh, two years, they kind of didn't make it. So, so that was an interesting, I, I cannot mention that, the brand, but that, that was a very interesting way they've built up the culture to also, mot so part culture, part compensation, that they also motivate people to stay longer, to make an impact. It was also very nice advice I heard from a podcast, uh, Georgina Smallwood from CPO of Tier mentioned that sometimes it just pays to stick around because also due to just how, uh, how attrition and how, how companies are happening. I did see many people get promoted just because they were there longer. 
Whereas, you know, if you skip around and skip around, um, it's possible you also may end up to be the last in and then the company does layoff and, and you're on your six months probation contract, at least in Germany, where these contracts are very vulnerable and, and so on. Of course, this is, again, very biased for me as a founder that I did notice that people who stick longer with our organization had a stronger impact and we also helped their career tremendously. Yeah. I mean, I really liked um, the, the, the two-year plan that that business put, put into place. I mean, I, I would guarantee they had a very good plan into how to deliver a product successfully, right? If they can plan what makes a successful product manager and lay it out over a two-year period, you know, they've, they've really put a lot of thought into it. Um, I wanted to ask, I know, look, we've covered, we've covered a lot of stuff here already, um, but we're talking about founders. So let's say for this, maybe 15 episodes I've, I've recorded before I've spoken with you now. Everyone's pretty much from a tech Which background. Record? <laughs> Everyone, everyone's pretty much from a tech background as well, right? So uh, they don't have that that product focus, but you can really see on their on their journey that they're learning how important this is. And some people are learning how important it is from a three person sized business to some people mm -hmm. really learning how important it is at a fifteen person sized business. Um, but what I'm going to ask you is that if you could give two pieces of advice to build a product focused company what what would it be <laughs> top two because i know we've said so much <laughs> mm, all right top, top two see if this fits with your business model first you know for, first and foremost does it does it really fit into what you're doing uh into who you're selling to and why and are you going to need this later and of course oh, sorry I, I need to retake this so retaking, see if it fits into your business model and the company culture that you want to build. Because in, in some cases, you may be equally successful by not having a product culture and by, by just having everything look relatively terrible because the, there are other factors that drive adoption. I did notice there's a um, bike shedding moment in product management. So bike shedding is the tendency for people to overly discuss or comment on trivial things that are observ observable, like um, a bike shed, because everyone sees it, everyone uses it, puts the bike. That, that's similar uh, discussion with user experience, with how things should look where, um, how should the copy read and so on. While important, they're, they're still not the core of the product. You, you can see indeed in food ordering apps like Vault, how they've differentiated through how the product looks, but that's not the only thing. They've also paid photographers to take pictures of the food, whereas the competitors don't even have that. So you're ordering a pizza, but you don't like know how that pizza looks like unless you've been to that restaurant or ordered from it before. So, so it's, you can say, okay, the Vault UI is amazing. They have like this Easter eggs. When you click on the timer, it pops up some burgers or some food and so on. But it's not it. If you look at it, they more looked on the Airbnb example where Airbnb sent professional photographers to the apartments and make them look less uh, sketchy. Uh, beating sometimes even photography from... Uh, Booking that go right, and then when when you end up in the apartment, like and and now this uh, fifteen square meter uh, studio where the kitchen is next to my bed looked so much bigger in the picture before I booked it. So that's that's a bit of a down, downside effect, but but they did do that. And another interesting thing is that the first session is free, so then the restaurants will need to pay to retake photos in case the menu changes or some aesthetics change, which is again very clever business sense. On, on that, right? You, you will get the setup for free. Everything looks nice. You uh, repeating. You get set up initially for free. You're probably also getting to get more traction. Um, and then later on, if something changes, then you pay for that. So then it's less operational overhead for the app after the initial setup cost. That, that would be nutshell advice. Be pragmatic see what fits. The other part is that the business model is also going to influence a lot of the things that you do. So, so might as well be very intentional about it. If, if you're selling to governments, 
then it definitely not going to be product led. Um, there are some things you can do, probably some in any case you can copy, but it, it's it's still probably the, the department that writes the tender is going to be one of the most important ones. So just accept that. If if that's your focus, and then try to hire the type of people that are not going to be precious about, oh, we need to put like this Easter egg in the UI. No one cares. You need to first get the tender to go through. <laughs> you you need to to set this up. It's it's even if let's say someone really, really hates this software somewhere in the government, they're not going to have the power to to change it. Uh, and and they can't even install things on their PC or access certain URLs. We've we've had a lot of these managed laptops from our clients, and we couldn't access DeepL Translator on one of them. I had no idea why. It's a very good translation tool, also our client, but we couldn't access it. So that is the environment your customer operates in. An another customer we had um, for a B two B SaaS tool, helping optimize a factory costs via a mix of IoT and um, and software, we deployed it at a toilet paper factory in, in the middle of nowhere. There, there was no connectivity. There were some old PCs with Internet Explorer there. So the, the web app needed to be compatible with Internet Explorer. Again, not probably design wouldn't have won this. It's, it was also an accessibility topic right now that we needed to, to bake into that. Uh, I, I hope it makes sense. Of course, you can always do good things and apply good practices, uh, but I would also caution about pragmatism as I'm feeling that this is starting to miss in in many of the product management enthusiasts I speak with. Yeah, do you know what? And I, I can't remember where it was I read it, but I read like some of the most uh, successful changes in UI. I think one was a nice example is like Etsy. Um, they were able to like increase their checkout ratio by like 60% by reducing the fields that you have to import from like 11 down to six. And like it just ma massive uptick in the amount of actual successfully checked out products. Not fancy, if anything, less fancy. And um, it, it, it was just, it was just a massive success. And, you know, I think it's, it's one small example, right? When you're talking about pop-ups and, nice pictures right it's you also have to think of ease of accessibility which i know you, you touched on as well mm -hmm. um yeah i'm ready to to jump into the quick fire questions are you ready super yes good um so yes starting off nice and easy uh, a book podcast or a piece of content that you would recommend to other listeners obviously awesome by april Dunfold. I, I feel she should get more traction and more praise for the book. Has, of course, a, a lot of tangences with jobs to be done, which I'm also a big fan of. That's nice. Um, what would you say your three non-negotiables are when it comes to leadership? And look, you can talk about it as personal individual leadership, or we can talk about it as product leadership. Um, I, I would focus on product leadership and also our company principles at Product People. One would be abiding by our principles that um, w where we've also tried to encompass all the things that would make you successful here without, without being too rigid to the rules. So I, I could read out the principles and then I think this is one and two question as an, as an answer. So our first principle cool. is being low maintenance, high results. Second principle, solve for the client and our company. Third principle, spread knowledge generously. Fourth, be excellent and candid to each other. And fifth, optimize for long-term profitability and growth. And I've also aimed to live by these principles myself when uh, interacting with our employees also with clients and sometimes also judging clients by our principles, because if we feel like a client is being high maintenance, maybe at some point our people would be dissatisfied with working with them and consider exiting product people due to being unhappy on that specific client. So we also try to monitor that on, on our end, because if a client is creating churn, maybe they're 
not helping us um, optimize also for long-term profitability and growth. So it, it applies both way. And I would suggest um, everyone to think of maybe for themselves, not necessarily in the company principles. I know many times these are just like some uh, letters uh, in a deck and then no one cares about. We did try to, to make them actionable at product people. Um, I think I've seen also someone say, think of your personal principles. And then when you're job hunting or appraising your current fit with your company, see if these are matching what uh, you can experience or do or have observed at this company. Nice, nice principles. And I'll, uh, I'll have to check them out on the website again. Really, really good ones. I have final question, Morella. What would you do differently if you could do it all again? Oh, so many things. Probably the the most salient memory has been to mutually and nicely part way with people that are not a culture fit. And I know this learning also comes from the very crazy 2020 to 2022 times where we started off with one employee in 2020 and, and grew to about 40 in 2022. And, and have maintained that um, number since. And it was pretty hard. We were competing all the time with heavily funded uh, startups that would just inflate titles and salaries and everything. So I, I know it came from a good place. It's like, okay, we need people. We need to figure out how to hire. We're going to be maybe lenient on that. Or we now need, these people are staffed on this current client. We need to keep them for a bit longer for the client experience. But once we changed our mindset and say, okay, if someone is not abiding by our uh, product people principles, especially be excellent and candid with each other. So yeah, no toxic people or no difficult people that are, are just creating more friction for us internally as we need people to be extremely collaborative compared to an in-house PM. Once we had this non-negotiable, it just made things so much easier. Just felt stuff went further, faster, less drama, and it has continued since. So, so maybe that, that would be, I know a lot of founders that I spoke to. So whenever I meet with other founders, they complain either about their employees or their investors, or sometimes if they're B2B about their clients, you know, it just, <laughs> the clients are at the top up. So I, I know it's, it's not a new problem. Um, and it's something you gain with experience when it really hurts, but that, that, that has helped us ever since. So we always now evaluate long-term fit with product people and are also very helpful and candid with our people is say, hey, let's discuss your onwards journey or let's even help you get a job if you feel that this is not a fit. And in many, many cases, we had people come to us after we asked them, hey, think if, if this is a long-term fit. And I said, hey, I thought about it. And it's actually, yeah, you're right. It's not a long-term fit. Um, in some cases, they said, I don't even want to do product anymore because we had a few associates, you know, how, how it is very hyped. To, to go into product, they come in, they do the work. It's like, oh, this is not what I wanted. Well, then this was a great experience. You, you learn something without getting stuck to, to long in a job, or they see that this is not a fit for them at product people with our collaborative and transparent culture, which is then also a win for everyone. And that we try to have rather quicker than later because still life is still short, right? We don't have life extension and, and other things. And, you're just going to be able to work for maybe 30, 40 years or rather spend them better. Look, Marilla, that's that's us. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Really great to get an insight into into the product world, your experience. I really appreciate it. Really enjoyed having you on the show. Amazing, Anthony. It was a pleasure. That concludes another enlightening episode of the Leadership Labs podcast. If you found today's episode thought provoking and informative, be sure to subscribe to the Leadership Labs on your preferred podcast platform or on YouTube. Thank you once again for joining us on this journey through the Leadership Labs. Until next time.